My name is Monica Dinsdahl. I am the facilitator in this series of basic hypnosis training. Today we are looking at chapter 7 in this book, the syllabus for the training, which is available through hypnosisalliance.com for free if you're interested in the download. It's called Formulating Suggestions. We all use our minds in different ways and we put ourselves in training. For example, someone who has a situation where they are a cigarette smoker and they want to stop smoking cigarettes may say something like, I want you to put me in trance so I quit smoking cigarettes. Well, that person's already in trance. They're in cigarette trance. And we have to take them out of the cigarette trance and get them into the I'm an air vision mammal trance. So it's a matter of which trance is the person using. The trance being anything that sets up a communication between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. So, how do you perceive the situation? Which is why I say to you, oh, please start every module you do with me with a focus of intent. And that is to make the circle, put in the center of it what you intend to do here today, and then, if you like, put all of the obstacles around the edges of the outside of the circle so you know what to aim for. Center. Go for your bullseye. All the other things may arise. The most important part is to focus on that which you desire. So, your perceptions, I can do it. Oh, no, I can't. Will affect your decisions and your actions. Anything that can be perceived. creates ideas, suggestions, for things you may experience, do, or think. Successful suggestions create perceptual arousal that leads to some form of positive response. Your thoughts are generally not put into action until at least two senses are stimulated. When a series of perceptions connect to form a thought, the thought can lead to action in which each idea in its proper place is certain to appear and is beyond the power of the individual to resist it. For example, when you read or hear, think of a horse. You may have a variety of perceptual memories that comprise a horse. Oh, it has hooks, four legs, long tail, white mane, has a certain way it smells. If you ride, oh, there's a certain response of your body to riding a horse. The form, smell, and sound may flash so quickly through the inner images that you don't even notice them consciously. Or, as I just did for a moment, I may pass through them rather quickly, or I can indulge and leisurely savor. My perceptual memories and stimulations regarding the word horse. It's only a word symbol, and that word symbol allows me to assign to that symbol all kinds of perceptual reality. All those little details I mentioned about the long tail and the four hooks, those are details, and that's called chunking down. That's a part of an advanced class in neurolinguistic programming, becoming aware of how you chunk down into detail and how you chunk up into horse, which fits somewhere in there, mammal. Yeah, we can chunk up bigger, we can chunk down smaller. It's like looking at a telescope or looking at a microscope. How do we want to look at what we're going to do with hypnosis today? Once you've clearly defined your goals for the session, the hypnotist helps you paint a picture on the canvas of your mind with the power of suggestion. Pacing your voice to the breathing of the person you're working with is useful. Speaking slowly when learning is helpful for a novice hypnotist, but it's not necessary for the delivery of suggestion. The fastest hypnotist I've ever heard is Don Martin out of Missouri. <laughs> and I thought I was going to take notes on my computer. He came up as I opened my computer in his class and said, there's no recording. And I said, boy, I'm going to take notes. <laughs> And he laughed at me <laughs> for good reason. 
Within a half a page, I just turned off the computer and closed it down. He pointed a finger and laughed at me. He talks faster than an auctioneer. Oh, you think I talk fast? No, go meet Don Martin. What a marvelous rapid fire delivery. I think he was bragging he could cut his sessions down to one half the time and make more money. Or cut his prices so he could serve more people in an affordable realm. So, by pacing yourself with your voice and your breathing, by speaking slowly, you know, the words of themselves may arouse no action. You may have an influence from the environment, the tone of your voice used, the expression on, the, on your face, and your body movements, which all influence thought. These nonverbal communication skills tend to create easier communication. It works pretty well within the same culture. What happens then when you have cross-cultural communication? Oh my! The potential for miscommunication occurs when you're working with people from other cultures or even intergenerationally within the same family or same culture. So the more one senses congruity, which means my actions and words do the same thing, the greater is the ability to trust and move rapidly in response to incoming ideas and suggestions. For example, when I'm being congruent, I say yes and my head goes like this. I say no and my head goes like this. And that is a congruent message. But when I say yes and my head goes like this, oh, I just got dizzy in the side. That doesn't feel good for me. Or if I say no while my head goes like that, that felt dizzy too. I didn't like that. Because I would rather say yes like this and no like this. And that way I'm pretty darn clear about what I'm delivering, both with my words and with my actions. As you paint a picture in the mind of the subject with your voice, words, actions, comment on what you perceive with your senses. These are truisms. Natural phenomena are truisms. If you see the person go like this, Now that was a big sigh. I might comment on, that was a big sigh. And then the unconscious mind notices, Monica's paying attention to me. The body notices, Monica's paying attention to me. And I bring the conscious mind into awareness that I'm being very attentive to what's going on in the person's body. If the neck goes around, that's called reaction and I might ask what's going on with that head roll if the hand starts to thump or the shoulder twitches I might say geez what does that hand or shoulder have to say I comment on what I see and in that way I build rapport I'm letting the person know I'm paying very close attention to you right now and who is the last person to give you this much attention I'm going to do a really good job of reflecting to you what I observe and you can tell me whether I'm right or not, and let me tell you. <laughs> People in hypnosis don't let you be wrong for very long. Do I go fishing? Of course. Sometimes the person's like, oh, finding hen's teeth and pulling them. There's, there's nothing there. I got a beta hook and throw it in. I see fishing. Sure. And I'll say, I think I observe, or I'm thinking that, or, you know, I, what do you think? And they'll say, oh, yeah, there you are. They're like, mm, you really are. I'm like, oh, I bait the hook again. That's hard work. Wouldn't it be much easier to say, I notice your foot is thumping. If the thumping foot could speak, what would it say? The foot usually goes silent, stops moving, until I ignore it again and we start the conversation. Oh, the foot will start again. Because trauma is locked into the muscles and the periphery and they seek release. It's a desire with micro movements and then amplifying the micro movements to allow whatever residual, I'm not done with it feeling, that's in the body to have a release and then the body can relax. Here we are. The theme of this basic hypnosis class is how do we relax? How do we have fun relaxing? How do we build suggestion? How do we use good suggestion? How do we go into trance, deliver suggestion, and then come back out again and feel really good? Oh, it's fun.
also come up on shared perceptions. For example, as rapport is being built, there may be a siren that goes up. And you can say, the background sound of the siren reassures you all well in the outside world. If anything should occur which requires your immediate attention, you arouse yourself immediately, tend to what needs to be tended to, and return immediately to this state of relaxation or deeper, knowing this has been very effective in everything you've done. And in that way, you take a common thing, oh, the siren's going by, and you add a bunch of suggestions to it that are all positive about what can be done if a person's letting himself learn how to relax. And every suggestion that's built and accepted makes the lower suggestions more powerful. So, while giving suggestions, the best response is give your attention 100% to your client. The focus of attention gives a powerful rapport. The focus is more commonly found in moments of intense emotion, love making, loving someone dearly, being a parent or a child. Few people willingly devote such focused attention to another person, other than a parent or a grandparent or a sibling. So as you lead a person, as you lead yourself, gently, through your own responses of relaxation, ask questions. Solicit feedback and mirror the subject to enhance the subject's experience. Trigger the mirror neurons to relax. Practice your own relaxation. Get good at it. When you get to the challenge line of a suggestibility test, take a more direct approach using the rapport that has been built to lead the subject's mind. The subject's mind has already been receiving suggestion, followed by another suggestion, compounding the effects of all the suggestions given. The goal is for the subject to be so deeply into what they're doing that they rarely notice when you direct command of, you will try to open your eyes, open your hands, bend that arm, and you cannot. It just won't work. You will try to open your eyes, and you'll find they just won't work. It's just too much effort. You'll find, you'll try hard, and you'll find that arm just won't bend no matter how hard you try. Now, the challenge isn't given for long. It's only given for a short period of time, but it's a challenge to let the imagination lock around the idea and play with it. It's fun. And in this way, we bypass the conscious mind. It's time to play. With the acceptance of a perception, the imagination has been excited, aroused, and the critical faculty has been bypassed. And that's the point at which we can look at deepening, delivery of the suggestions the person has specifically asked for and that has cultivated with you, and emergence with post-hypnotic suggestions for well-being, perhaps post-hypnotic amnesia so that phenomena unfolds automatically. One of the funniest things I have noticed in sessions is besides my trying to keep track of what we were going to do in the next session, which doesn't work in hypnosis. People resolve things between sessions. <laughs> I need to ask when they come in the door, and what's different since the last time you were here? Because <laughs> they tell me the most amazing things. People resolve things that they didn't even mention were at issue. And even funnier is when they come in and I say, well, what have you done? And they say, I did absolutely nothing that you told me to do. I don't know what happened. Really? So why are you back? You know, they're spending money with me and they're back for more and absolutely nothing happened. And then as the session unfolds, they tell me all the things they did that resolved the issues from the previous week, but they don't have to consciously remember it anymore. The conscious mind goes like, ugh, ugh. You know, and the unconscious mind, what's done, here's the next part of the shopping list. So the conscious and the unconscious minds can communicate with you in very different ways. Some directly, some indirectly. Now, how do we develop effective suggestions? These are from the Hypnosis Training Institute in Glendale, California. I took a scholarship with Mark Gilboyne in 1987. After serving as an assistant to his assistant, yes, I volunteer for things. I'm an opportunity. At his very first annual hypnosis conference, and I said the name of his hypnosis organization wrongly in one of the earlier uh, programs. I called it uh, the American Society of Hypnot. 
It's the American Council of Hip and Tipsy Tammers. I think I said it was the American Society of Hip and Tipsy Tammers, but it's not. The acronym is ACHE, and we made, <laughs> we made plenty of jokes about member ACHE, A -C -H -E, which is what our current says. So Gilboin, that's his stage name, we're going to go with it, said there are five things to do to get really good suggestions. First is to be positive. State what you want instead of what you don't want. In NLP, that's called a moving toward instead of a moving away from strategy. Take a moment to envision your desired outcomes, the solution, rather than the problem itself. So the first thing is to use a positive statement and put your mind toward that which you desire. Oh, this guy sounds like Thoreau, doesn't he? Why don't we aim rightly at that which we desire? The second thing is awareness. This is on pages 64 and 65 in the syllabus, which is referred to as the basic hypnosis training, hypnotherapy volume one, course 100. Pages 65 and 64. The third issue, oh, awareness is what I'm looking at. Whatever you are aware of, you will attract. Whatever you dwell upon will come to you because everything that you could possibly want is in the, in the environment around you somewhere, whether it's close or far. And when you dwell upon that which you desire, you will attract it to you because you will attract yourself to it like it's a magnet. Mom, I've got to have those shoes. <laughs> i got to have them. I'll go and get a second job so I can have those shoes, right? Those ones that light up when you run. Yeah. When you put mental energy into something, you tend to find it everywhere. So this is why drug addicts who say they're leaving town so they can stay away from the drugs have a problem because wherever they go, they're going to find their drug until they change what's going on inside. It's an inside job, not an outside job. I mean, changing people, places, and things, that works. It also requires the inside job, the old brain, the newer brain, the newest brain, new kid on the block. Okay, so with awareness, use your affirmations to focus on the result you desire or the method of obtaining the results rather than the problem. So, for example, on page 64, it says, I'm in control of my appetite. Well, that suggestion is a little bit rough because it infers that the appetite is out of control. So um, a better suggestion might be, I eat as much as I need to sustain my body perfectly. The next one is to use the present tense. Use now. Present tense is, I will die until I lose. No, that's future tense. I'm going to do it tomorrow means it never comes because that's not today. I am more and more slender each and every day. There's Emil Kuei talking, right? It makes it present tense. It brings it right now. It says what it is that I prefer. I dwell upon that which I desire and it comes to me. The fourth thing is to be specific. Specific. Carefully state that which you desire, avoiding slang or words with multiple meanings. I am losing 20 pounds. Oh, I go crazy when I lose things. I don't want to lose my weight and find it again. I want to shed it, reduce it, discard it, eliminate it, throw it away. Yeah? Each and every day I'm closer and closer to my goal of 148 pounds or a size 10 or 12. You see, I can be very clear about what I want, and then my brain frames around it, and my intent gets clear. And the most important part is to own it. I am. The fifth thing that's necessary for a good sentence, a good suggestion, is I am.
There will be a multicultural component to this study. I'm hoping to bring over a man named Johnny, who was a driver to different tours, who has a whole approach to life that deals with I am. Perhaps he will give us permission to take a look at his YouTube as well and have some conversation. I've already asked him, will he be willing to talk about death from a Hindu guru type perspective? I've asked him to look at attention, which he refers to as the outward mode of the soul. And I asked him to recite a prayer from one of his gurus, Prabhu Nibiru, and he said, no, it came out of the secret teachings book. <laughs> it's a wonderful prayer, and I do not have the liberty to share that one with you. There are many wonderful prayers that allow us to find who and what we are. Um, before this module is complete, I will have a group hypnosis for all of us. I will composite the suggestions relevant to this module. And it will include evocation of divine spirit. Now, how do I edit my affirmation? We're going to be doing this when I get feedback from all of you who are participating. Thank you. And uh, we'll take uh, your words, put them up here, we'll break them down, we'll use these five rules. So once you've written your affirmations, be sure you have specific, written in present tense, once you've corrected any of your wording errors and entered yourself into the equation, then enter self-hypnosis. Relax. Breathe. Relax for several minutes before you review your affirmations again. And then discard any affirmations that make you feel uncomfortable. Trust yourself, your brain. I'm standing now. Let me show you the brains again. The belly brain. I, I, I always look up the numbers of neurons that are firing in the brain. It's a smaller number than what's happening in, oh, the brain of the heart. Lots more neurons firing in here. And then, whoa, the new kid on the block, the neocortex. And here's how my decision making was. Usually, like when it came to doing the uh, past life phenomena, and this thing just said, that stuff's not real. Doesn't fit my paradigm. But this part went, hey, my clients are getting better. They say it works. And the heart said, I, it, it's confusing. It doesn't match my religious uh, beliefs from my Catholic foundation. I'm no, in that place where they don't, they don't match, and I'm not a practicing Catholic anymore. But the foundation is still there. It's what I need. It's very strong for me. And finally, my, my gut saying it works, and my heart saying people are getting better. My head says, well, I'm going to do it because it works. The neocortex is the new kid on the block. And as I've read about the three brains of the body, the triune brain is not just the uh, neocortex, mammalian brain, and reptilian brain that runs up the head. If the old brain is the guts, it's all about good food and good sex. And all these one cell beings come together, and we got this marvelous biome in the guts here that's still, you know, bacteria who live in us and keep us alive and well, the good ones anyway. And then we get this, oh, compassion thing, and, and we come more connected with who and what we are, and we care for each other. And that's better food than sex. And then, uh, oh, the new kid on the block, oh, even better food than sex. So these three brains for me need to be in collusion, my conscious mind and my, my body brain, and then that unconscious mind, that creative unconscious stuff that Carl Jung talked about, that allows us to commune with that divine being that I'm of the opinion we are all part of. Now, I have in here Also, affirm the method as well as the end result. Proper attitudes and your own per personal beliefs in the attainment of your goals are a part of your creating what's meaningful for you. How do you use suggestions to, to aim yourself rightly, to put your arrow in your bow and notch yourself and, and aim and hit your target? You can bypass all the logical arguments against your goals by using idiomotor finger response to confirm your choice of affirmations or by using a pendulum. And we'll be doing both of those things. A uh, pendulum will definitely be in this class and I will in integrate idiomotor responses, which are normally in the next class, into this one because they're fun. Now, keyword trigger. We've been talking about that since the very first part of this module. How do I make a keyword trigger? Well, I take all those thoughts and ideas that are relevant to the suggestions I've made about what I want for myself at this time. And I say this one word or phrase will summarize all that so I don't have to read those affirmations 50 times. I can just see that word and say that word. I can take that word and put it on a little post-it or in my wallet. 
or uh, in the bathroom. And just one word can remind me of all those thoughts, ideas, and feelings that I'm experiencing as I'm moving toward my goal. I've matched myself with an arrow in my bow, and I've set myself rightly upon my goal. And when I get there, I say, job well done. Right? So there's ways that you can harness your own ideas with a single word or short phrase that allows you to summarize all those things in your head. And let's say learning takes, okay, three days we start breaking a habit. There is seven to ten days. The habit's like about gone. And now we have three weeks or four weeks of three weeks is the shortest time I've found for myself. I reset a new pattern. And then I'm like a, a caterpillar going into a chrysalis and coming out the other side of the butterfly that I'm dreaming of on this side of my objective. So post-hypnotic suggestions is the last part of chapter 107. Chapter 7. What are post-hypnotic suggestions? They're the kind of suggestions that we give when we want people to respond afterwards, for example. <clears throat> The response is projected or continued into the waking state. Let me think of a good one. Okay, I've assumed my position and I'm telling myself that the things I'm about to study are leaving a permanent and lasting impression upon my subconscious mind available for my recall when I acquire it. And so you might want to put yourself in a position with your feet on the floor and your hands on your thighs. Pick that spot slightly above eye height. Take a good deep breath. And as you exhale, notice how good it feels to Relax. And on the second good deep breath, I breathe it in. Oh, filling myself with light and breathing out all darkness. And then on the third good deep breath, I hold it for a count of three. And I think to myself, all the thoughts, ideas, and feelings that I'm having from teaching and learning hypnosis during this training is just absolutely wonderful. It's leaving a permanent and lasting impression upon my subconscious mind, available for my recall when I require it. And then I close my eyes. And notice how good it feels. Let that all just sink in. Is everything I learned today is leaving a permanent and lasting impression upon my subconscious mind available for my recall when I require it. And it's okay if I can remember to forget it because when I need that information, it's going to come up for me. And that's the only time it'll have to come up, just like when I tie my shoes. I don't have to think about tying my shoe all day long. I just need it to come up when I need it. And then it can go back down, and I don't have to worry about my shoelace unless I untie it again while I'm walking and have to bend down and tie it again. This is a gestalt approach that in our worlds we have a foreground, what I'm paying attention to right now is I'm looking directly at the camera. In the background is uh, the backdrop for filming. There are beings in the background. There's fans going. There's lights going. There's papers flowing. There are people that wander through that are not part of the filming. <laughs> and they come into the kitchen. And yes. What I'm focused on is right now on the camera, and yet there's all that periphery of stuff that something emerges and becomes important, and then it becomes a focal point, and when it's done, it fades to the background again, and something else becomes my focal point. According to Fritz Perls, we are driven by emergent need. If I have to have a glass of water, the emergent need is thirst. Once I've drank my water, a short while later, I might say, hmm, I think I have to relieve myself of water now, and so whatever the need is at the moment becomes foreground, and everything else slides into the periphery and goes background. So post-hypnotic suggestion. Is our response as projected or continued into the waking state? Like I find myself moving so easily. In a size 10, 12, 10. I find it loose and limber and wonderful. I find myself 148 pounds and lithe, limber, toned, and relaxed again. See, these are all positive things said in the moment of now where I can remember and I can feel and I can do and I move toward that automatically. So that means when I have a choice between Oh, shall I have a piece of the dessert? Or maybe I'll have a big sweet potato. They're both dessert. They're both sweet, which one's better for me? The, the sugar thing over there? Or the sweet potato thing with some, uh, oh, it has some nutritional elements in it. If I don't throw the sugar and butter <laughs> the things on it, then make it taste like dessert. Because all of a sudden, water is sweet. And the, the sodas don't appeal to me anymore. And the taste of the synthetic sweeteners is such that it's like, I'd rather just have plain water because water is the food of the gods. Here's we are. Made up of how much percentage of water? A majority. The second response that's post-hypnotic is a response elicited from a sudden signal or subconscious message or stimulus. For example, we watch a movie and the person's drinking a Pepsi instead of a Coke or the other way around. And we think, oh, that's my favorite soda. Or perhaps we smell cut grass and it reminds us of an incident from childhood. Or 
a perfume from a loved one. And these things happen very quickly. And in the case of hypnosis, we can give a post-hypnotic suggestion. In stage shows, and I have participated and had great fun, I've had a hypnotist say, every time I tug my ear, you'll find yourself doing this. Or every time I tug my tie. Or even in the movies. Here we go to Hollywood now. I believe uh, one of them is called On a Clear Day. And every time I tap the pencil, you can go into trance. And the psychologist taps his pencil or pen on the desk, and uh, Barbara Streisand playing the lead in that one goes into trance. So there are many ways every time I point at you, you go into trance. You know, and if I don't watch out, then I point at a person not thinking about it, and they, because they want to, slide into a marvelous trance place. So, here's an example of a projected post-hypnotic suggestion. That's fine. When you emerge from trance and return to full waking state, you will remember to forget all about that. Or, you can remember to forget those things until you're strong enough to deal with all that. Here's another projected example. That's fine. As I count from five to one, you will return to full waking state, feeling better than you felt before, better than you felt in a long time, remembering to forget all those things you don't need to remember. Here's an elicitation example. That's fine. Close your eyes. When I have you open your eyes, anytime you see me, you will instantly jump up and say, what a wonderful day. So anytime I do this, you will have that amazing response. You will just jump up and say, oh, what a wonderful day. You won't remember that I gave you this suggestion, but you will react to it. You can forget consciously this whole conversation, but anytime I, you're going to jump up and say, oh, what a wonderful day. It will happen instantaneously. You won't remember that I gave you this suggestion. Forget the whole conversation, but be guided by it. All right now, open your eyes, please. How do you feel? And then at some point later, I, I do a look at and make an eye contact and I do a tuggy tuggy. I make sure the person's paying attention. If I have to, I look several times to see how long does it take a person to respond to that kind of suggestion. I am so suggestible that if I accept someone's suggestion like that, they can do a signal on the other side of the room and if I see it in the corner of my eye, I'll slide right out of your chair. Yes, <laughs> I've had that happen more than once in basic training. Well, that is the end of Chapter 107. And that is almost to the end of the pre-assignment for the three-day class at the International Medical and Dental Hypnotherapy Association. The pre-conference class is no additional cost. If you are registered for the conference, you can, I think there's pre-registration. I don't know what the class limitation is. But the book, it's free. You can download it from hypnosisalliance.com. You can learn hypnosis. It doesn't cost you a penny. If you want to practice it, that will cost you something. You've got to pay for the hypnosis conference. And uh, we are looking at putting this into a continuing education format sometime in the next uh, 14 months. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to seeing you at the IMDHA Hypno Conference in Daytona Beach, the second week in May 2016.